Hello, and welcome to the Wheel of Crime podcast. This podcast is ran by two ladies who play games, mumble profanities, and laugh way too often. Also, this podcast does cover topics of sensitive nature, and as such, listener discretion is advised. Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of the Wheel of Crime podcast. My name is Jan. And my name is Emily. Yes, welcome back. Um, Time, <laughs> time has once again gone by. But if I don't mention <laughs> time it. Time, constantly mention, passing. Yes, yeah, slowly passing one tick at a time. But no, I feel like if I don't mention it, then, you know, it's at this point, it's tradition. But no, uh, I will say, though, Speaking of time, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but I just realized this again this morning. I have, like, a clock, like, a, a wall clock with, like, the, the ch- 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 like, thing, the, the hands that move. Um, and I took the batteries out of it, like, a year ago because they were dead and I didn't have the right ones to replace it. I've been having it turn on every now and again and the hands start moving. And just today, after, like two or three months of it not working, it just started ticking again. And it has Hmm. zero batteries in it. It has not had batteries in it for probably like a year and a half. Odd. Maybe your cats are winding it up. (laughs) I hope so. Because I was talking about (laughs) this with Andrew at one point. Because I was like convinced, right, that he was like just sticking batteries in it and then not telling me and then throwing them out. Because every time I look in there, it's empty, right? And he was like... Emily, I don't think I've ever seen the hands move on that clock. I don't think it's had batteries in it since we got it. And I was like, spooky. Spooky, 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 spooky. Right? I'm like, it's it's the apartment ghosts. They love my clock. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we do have one very important announcement before we get into our episode today. Uh, Emily and I are going to be taking our annual summer vacay from the podcast. Non-actual vacay from anything. We're going to be both working like crazy, but um, a podcast vacay for a month. So we shall be returning to you on, let me uh, pull up my (laughs) calendar so I know what date I'm referring to. We will be returning to you on June 24th so the podcast will be back we're taking a month off but we'll be back on june 24th with some awesome new episodes for you yes with our time we're going to be taking a look at maybe freshening up our look in a couple different ways um we've already kind of been dabbling in that a little bit recently and you know it's about time it's about time to take a look at kind of what we're doing and all that different type of stuff and uh it definitely doesn't hurt with everything else going on so (laughs) Yeah, we got new music already, but uh, we might have some new cover art for you and some other fun things, so stay tuned for that. Yes, it'll be fun and fancy. Yes, exactly. (laughs) But without further ado, let's get into our episode. Oh, hell yeah. I will spin our wheel of questions then. What is the craziest thing that's ever happened in your hometown? Um, hmm. The craziest thing. Like, what's the most hot, juicy gossip you've ever heard about? Just, like, not even necessarily someone you know from our hometown, but, like, just, like, someone within the community. Because Emily okay. and I come from the you same already, hometown. You already know my answer on this, because I gave you the juicy goss, like, whatever it was, like, a month or two ago. But I will <laughs> share it again, because of who I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, so, I was trying to, like, when you asked this, I was trying to think of, like, news-worthy items. Like, things that would have actually made the local news. Which, honestly, like, I don't know if there really is anything. Uh, our hometown's a little notorious for, like, like drugs and weapons, it part? used to be the crime capital of Canada. Is it not anymore? I'm pretty sure I it don't still know. is. <laughs> I, I think it's definitely still up there. I don't know if it's number one anymore, but it used to be, for uh, sure. Yeah, like, uh, where we come from has a huge issue with uh, people doing drugs, and then they get weapons, and then they And stealing vehicles. Oh, theft is a big one. Uh, I think one of the first things I ever learned living here was if it's outside, you're locking that shit down. Your car, you're locking it down. Your bicycle, you're locking it down. 
your fucking garden gnomes, you're locking them down. If you don't lock it down, you're prepared to lose it forever. Well, that's the thing. It's like, if, you are, if you're not locking it down, you gotta tell yourself in your head and be like, if it goes missing... I've already, I ex- I've already accepted it, and it's my fault. <laughs> I should I should have locked it down. <laughs> Even if it's on my balcony and I'm on the fourth floor and I don't lock it down, if I lose it, it's my bad. Literally. Okay, quick side story. <laughs> the reason Jenny's saying this is because I don't even remember how many summers ago it was, but it's relevant because now it's the summer. Uh, but we had a guy in my apartment building on the third floor. Some guys got, or people, I don't know if they were guys, but people climbed the side of the building up until the third floor and hijacked his barbecue (laughs) and then took off (laughs) into the sunset. (laughs) And I still think about it all the time. And I'm like, I would love to know, first of all, why is Spider-Man in need of a barbecue from the third floor of this building? And second of all, just, I would love to know how they did it. That's all I got to say. But, um, would take some serious skill, I think. Well, I think you gotta like, cause it's smooth. Not like like to extrapolate my whole uh, location or anything like that. But like where I live, the apartment, the walls are smooth. It's not very climbable. Um, but yeah, well, I guess back to what your question was. So the juiciest goss that I've heard for the town that we're from, uh, it, actually that I recently heard about, is that there is a so to again kind of triangulate where we're from. We are from a bigger city in central Alberta. And apparently in our hometown, there is a enormous sex club. And they like operate. It's like under the cover of night. It's like super, it's like invite only this whole thing. And like, there's, it's just, it's a whole system. And I had somebody telling me about it because they were invited and a good friend of theirs used to be uh, a member of this club. So I got to hear quite a bit about it. And I would say as far as like recent Juicy Goss, like that is for sure it. Because just with the nature of the town that we're from, I didn't even think that that was like an option. So that's cool for them. Uh, uh, and it's definitely in a place in within the city that you would never expect. No, like literally everything that I've heard about it has blown my mind because it's just completely unexpected. Like where it is, unexpected. What it is, unexpected. What people are doing there, because it's also partially like Swingers. a bar, like meetup spot. Also bizarre. Like the whole thing, the whole thing. And I... I won't get into it, but I am one of those people who are like, tell me everything. So like, I got to hear about like what happens on the different floors, like what kind of people go, like what people do usually to get an invite was the other thing, which like, it's usually just like knowing a person. But I guess if you know, if somebody directs you to like one of the people who host for these particular events, um, because during mm-hmm. the day, the, it, during the daytime, it's a different business. So if you know one of the people who host these events, you go through kind of like an interview process, which I thought was interesting. So the more I learn, the more I'm like, mm, juicy. this is juicy. <laughs> 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 and like what I wouldn't give to be a fly on the wall for one of these things just to see what happens. Because it doesn't even sound real. But now having like shared what I know with a couple people, apparently if you're somebody who is like uh, a partier who is also sexually active. Most people know of this place already, but it's like it's not like hush hush, obviously, but it's just more like um on the down low. It's on the down low cuz not everybody also knows like where people stand on like how like deviant they are, I guess. So basically, if you've heard, they've already kind of like mentally accepted you into the fold, which I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, yeah, no, I've I've like not like, uh, what's the word I'm searching for? Uh, so with the person I know who does know more about this kind of stuff, I've, like, interviewed them for, like, everything. I'm like, all right, here's the deal. Like, what happens next? Like, what is the deal here? So I, I've learned what I 
what I needed to know. And uh, yeah, I still think it's super interesting. So that would be my juicy goss from our hometown. See, I don't feel like I have a ton of juicy gossip about our hometown because I haven't lived there for a while. <laughs> in like a long time. Like, not since like childhood 20, years. 2015. So it's been like eight eight ish years almost. Yeah. So, I mean, it took me this long to learn about this. And I, well, like, we, well, I've lived here forever. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, like, I do remember hearing about an insane car chase that happened in our hometown that, like, spanned, like, two of the smaller cities around our hometown (laughs) of a guy who, like, was with two other people and they like robbed somewhere and then they like drove through a bunch of different places like within the radius like within like a 30 minute radius of our hometown and like they had this police chase going on and then they tried to like get away but they all ended up in jail so didn't okay, that's work pretty funny uh for, for a hot minute, I thought you were going to share the one I told you about where apparently there's also, like, um, a big, uh, what's the, what's the word for it? Um, I was going to say witch's club, coven. That there's also a very large coven in, uh, in our hometown as well that I also learned about recently. And I shared that with you. I think, I don't know when that would have been. But for a hot minute, I thought you were going to talk about that. And I was like, oh my gosh, I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, L- lots of uh, good stories about our hometown, apparently. The, yeah, apparently. And uh, th- see, this is another thing, too, that I've been talking about a lot late with, lately with people. People just love to tell me stuff. I don't know why. <laughs> but, like, for example, like, anything I've learned, like, say, for example, about, like, uh, the, that, like, sex club or the coven or anything else. Like, this is just people sharing information with me. I don't, like, go around asking people and be like, hey... <laughs> Do you know about anything? It's just somehow people tell me these things. And I'm like, I don't know how we got here, but am I mad about it? No. But here we are. Here we are. (laughs) Here I am, a learned, a learned individual. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So much, so much learning. Um, But yeah, no, that's all I got. All right. Well, let's spin for our next question then. What is the craziest thing that has ever happened to you in our hometown? To me. I don't know. I feel like nothing really that exciting happens to me. Well, See, I don't know. My craziest thing, like, this is kind of insignificant now, but I remember at the time it being very traumatic, was Emily and I were, uh, I had just gotten my license, and we were driving to Walmart. <laughs> and it was like... That time in, like, the end of winter, beginning of spring, where, like, there's a bunch of rocks on the road, but, like, it's still kind of icy. And so I was driving a car that had a rear-wheel drive, and it, like, spit up a few rocks, and the person behind me, um, when we parked, they came out and they opened my door, and this lady started yelling at me and telling me, like, I chipped the paint on her car, and I was like, I don't think I did, and, like... There was, like, this big confrontation, and then, like, there was, like, literally no damage on her vehicle, and, like, I wasn't intending to spit rocks at her. It just, like, was kind of icy. Oh, no. It was so spooky. I remember she was interrogating you for information, and you wouldn't give it over, and this guy who was with her, he, like, motioned to where, like, the paint chip was, which was on, like, the side of the door, and I, like, went over, and I saw it was a piece of ice, and I literally, like, flicked it off with my nail, and then I, like, looked at him, and I was like where's the missing paint my friend (laughs) and he just looked at me and he was like (laughs) like it was it was bonkers it was and then this like random man who was walking back to his vehicle like saw this happening and he was like hey leave them alone (laughs) well like first of all i am 99 percent sure that this man is a dad to start and number two I'm he was <laughs> like absolutely and number two uh i think he saw what was actually going on which is that i'm pretty sure they were trying to get uh jen's information out of her for probably nefarious reasons uh because why else would you be going and like harassing like two 18 year olds 
Um, well, we would have, we were in high school, so I was 17. I think we're both 17 still. Oh, you're right. We would have been under the age of 18. But then that, again, that's another point. Like, now being older than that age, like, like, you know. It you was know, sketch. Very sketchy. But no, uh, yeah, that particular memory I, I try to block out, especially because I still go to that Walmart sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, it like, was meant- shared trauma. So. <laughs> it was traumatic. And then I remember telling my mom about it and she was like, what? Like, she didn't even think I was telling like, a real story. She was like, okay, when when's the joke coming up? <laughs> and I was like, there isn't one. This and really then happened. when she realized we were being serious, she was like mad. She was like, who was this woman? Well, my mom was like halfway to like calling the police. She's like, I'm gonna call the police. And I'm like, and do what? <laughs> Like, we don't know them. We're home. It was, like, three hours ago. Like, what are we going to do now? Anyways. No, she's really funny like that. Uh, oh, gosh. I was hoping your story would help me, like, trigger a memory for mine. Um, but I don't... Well, in my life, <laughs> I've known a lot of people. And I'm also very forgetful. So anytime something happens... That I think would, might be noteworthy in my life. For whatever reason, my brain's like, mm, you don't need that anymore. Pew. Uh, but as far as, like, if I'm thinking, like, a, like, more criminal side of things, since we do have a crime podcast, um, I will say that I remember going to a couple of house parties with some mutual friends of one of my cousins. And um, there was always this guy there that I didn't particularly like just because of his personality. And, uh... He was one of those people who, like, really thought that he was super well-liked. And I definitely went out of my way a few times uh, to let him know that, yeah, I actually thought he was kind of an asshole and not that he wasn't <laughs> funny and that I didn't like him, which he did not appreciate because he was like, oh, like you must be a fucking bitch because everybody here likes me. And I'm like, mm, actually, you're, like, super annoying. Get out! But no, Get out of here. And what makes this relevant is that I ended up finding out, like, literally two months later after, like... He, like, had this meltdown because I told him that I thought he was was annoying and, like, kind of a loser. Um, he actually went to jail. And it was because <laughs> he was a drug dealer, apparently, that I did not know about. And he was, like, pretty, like, deep into the, like, our hometown's, like, circle, I guess. Mm-hmm. And um, it ended up being a big thing, too, because somebody that you and I had gone to school with... Um, was the person who had called him in and it was because, uh, they were having, um, uh, relations with this dealer to obtain goods for free, but he went back on his end of the deal, so they called him in and uh that was interesting because uh even even from jail he was very vocal with his friends about how much he did not like me and i was like like me specifically specifically and i was like this man has not had anybody in his life tell him he's annoying i don't think i don't think so either right and i was like you know what Good for me. Somebody had to tell him. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And that's, like, one of the things I can think about where it's, like, anything that I was, like, a part of. But, like, I'm pretty removed from the situation other than, like, I guess him mentioning he doesn't like me from jail. But, like, you know, it is what it is. Water under the bridge. I'm not worried about it. Well, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let's spin for our next question. Okay. Have you ever had a crime committed against you? Or do you know of anyone who's had a crime committed against them in our hometown? Hmm, a crime. I know of many crimes. I'm trying to think of one that would make a good story. Because it's kind of like what we went over earlier. Like, I feel like theft is a big thing that happens Mm -hmm. to pretty much literally everybody I know who's lived here for more than, like, five, ten years. At some point, somebody's like... It was so crazy. Somebody stole my roller skates from my own backyard. And I'm like, did you lock them down? (laughs) (laughs) See, I have a recent one. Um, Ooh, yes. Okay. My partner's cousin 
had his truck stolen from his like uh front driveway like they smashed the window and hot wired the car and this was on easter weekend and then the next day the cousin's wife was driving and she got t-boned in the middle of an intersection but the person like did a hit and run and they didn't have insurance so she also lost they both lost their cars within two days that's actually insane i would be so pissed so fucking pissed Mm -hmm. oh gosh yikes i can't even i don't even want to think about that because like the whole idea that the more you think about something, the more likely it is going to happen. But, like, that would suck. It would really suck. I would be so mad. And then, oh, so they ended up finding the one cousin's um, truck that was stolen. But when they got it back, it was full of needles and was completely destroyed on the inside. Of course it would be. Of course yeah. it would be. Because what else would happen? Love that. Um, hmm. Okay. This is a hard one. It's like I said, usually when stuff happens, I like put it out of my head and then I try to like put it away. (laughs) That's That's a tricky one. I can't really think. But I do know that like what you're talking about, though, with like car theft and then it being full of needles. I feel like I've heard that happen to like a few different people. people. Like in my life for sure. But like it happens often enough where it's like, okay, like that's kind of a big issue. (laughs) See, I don't know. I feel like, like, I do know of crimes happening to people. It's almost always theft of something, like, small or, um, like, uh, like, some kind of attack. Like, I do know somebody who, um, they were mistaken for somebody else. Like, a guy at the bar had thought that he was the same guy that his girlfriend had cheated on him with. Like, there was a weird thing where he'd seen, like, a picture of this person, assumed that they were the same person. And, Mm -hmm. like, bottled him in the middle of the dance floor. Jesus. So I do know of something like that happening to somebody. And then, like, as far as theft goes, like, oh, yeah, like, car theft, like, any kind of theft. If it's not tied down, it's getting stolen. It's Um, gone. Yeah. I'm just going to go back to my barbecue story because that's, like, the funniest one I can think of. (laughs) And, like, I did (laughs) technically know the guy because, like, uh, some of the more social people in my apartment building like to hang out in, like, more of the common spots. And then if they see you regularly enough, then they're like, oh, hey, what are you doing? So someone's uh, done my barbecue. Yeah, I'm going to go with barbecue theft. (laughs) (laughs) Gosh, that's funny. Yeah, no, he definitely does not live here anymore. I think it's because he was very sad about a stolen barbecue, or at least that's what I'm telling myself. (laughs) (laughs) It was probably one of many things. Yeah, I think for sure that had to be up there somewhere. Um, The barbecue was the final straw. I like to imagine that it was. Like, he'd already had enough of certain things. He's like, yeah. Like, the motorcycle dealership and the highway. Like, those are my first two strikes. And then the barbecue went missing. And he's like, third one, I'm out. (laughs) I can't do this anymore. I can't stay here anymore. Which, like, fair enough. But, um, (laughs) yeah. Let's spin for our last question, then. Have you heard of any major crimes happening in our hometown? Like murder or like... Oh, hell yeah. Um, I It was literally just last... I'm pretty sure it was November. Um, I could be wrong. It feels recent. But there was a guy who... Um, well, it was actually ended up being a very sad story because this man, he was a victim of a house fire when he was like a little, little kid. And he had grown up and he was like an older man, like 80 years old or something like that. But, um, a teenager with a gun who was, there was something going on where he was like, um, having delusions of some kind or hallucinations thought that he was a demon and shot him in the parking lot at Walmart. Oh my God. Mm Mm-hmm. Because he saw him and he just, he had like burns, like literally from head to toe, like his face was really heavily scarred and everything and shot and killed him. Jeez, that's so bad. I was so sad about the whole thing too, because uh, of course afterwards um, there's the victim family statements and all of that. And they were like, you know, like they were like, despite what happened to him, like as a kid, like he had like a wife and like loving kids and grandkids and like all these different things. And I was like, oh, that is so sad. I can't even believe that. And then I don't even know what happened to the teenager because they were like an older teenager, like 17 
ish, 16 uh, or 17. So I don't know really what happened to them, but. That's crazy. Yeah. I have been told a story from someone in my family who personally knows uh, this man who he was like more on the wealthy side for our hometown at least mm-hmm. and he bought a house and he got married and he was like living next door to one of his friends from high school who was also like married and like a bit more wealthy and like well to do yeah so basically what ended up happening is his wife was poisoning him slowly and was hooking up with like like the neighbor or like this man who this man the main man the main man that my someone in my family knew was his wife was poisoning him and she was having an affair with the neighbor who was also his best friend and the neighbor was also doing something similar to his wife, so they're both trying to kill their partners off so that they could be together. They were in all this together? <laughs> oh my god! And so that they could just take all of, like, the guy, the main guy's uh, wealth, because I guess he was a bit more well to do than the, the neighbor guy. So, like, they were just, like, had this whole plot, and he was really sick in the hospital, and I can't remember how it was found out but the doctor realized what was happening and was like um like you're sir you're being poisoned because he was like always sick like his family couldn't figure out what was happening like he was bedridden by this point Mm -hmm. and like they realized what she was doing and there was like a sting operation where the cops like ended up like, basically catching her admitting to this. Because they ended up, like, doing this thing with the neighbor man. And mm-hmm. he got her to admit it to him on a phone conversation so that he could get a lighter sentence than her. <gasps> Dude. Uh, juicy. You've been sitting on this juicy little information and you didn't even tell me. Okay, that's bonkers, though. Also... Not to be, like, one of these people, but, like, I never even really considered poisoning to be a thing that could still happen just because of how much we know about poison and, like, how, like, if you, like, buy a certain amount of something, it's deemed as suspicious and you get flagged. Like, how did they even get away with that? Or almost get away with it. I mean, this happened, I believe this happened in the earlier 2000s. Even still, though, because, like, say, for example, with arsenic, like, there's pretty significant tells on whether or not somebody has arsenic poisoning or like I'm something else pretty sure it was like some sort of like household thing and like she was doing such trace amounts like over time that it just was like making him sicker and sicker see that is such a spooky thought too because like uh first of all as a woman i understand why when most women kill it's usually poisoning like i understand it uh but like the idea though that like you marry somebody and you're building a life with them and you have like a house together and all these things and then like the idea of you getting sick and you don't know what's wrong with you and you're like in the hospital and it turns out that like probably the person that you trust the most is the one responsible for like trying to kill you in a very like long and painful way i can't even imagine that it's like insane next time uh, I'm back in our hometown. You should come over to... I'll get my family member to tell you this story because I think there's, like, some other details I'm forgetting. Because it's, I'd love I, to know which... I'd love to know which neighborhood, too, because uh, I'm wondering... There's this one neighborhood. I'll tell you about it later. But uh, it, it's not far from where we used to live. Uh, but that area is actually particularly known for having people with lots of money who do, like, like crazier things. So, mm-hmm. like, there was, like... um a like weird heist that happened there at some point i don't know any details about it because this is one of those things that like people talked about but i never saw like an actual like thing about it but i went for a drive there once just like in general because like i said it's kind of close to where we would have grown up um and i actually saw a i don't even know what they're called um basically one of the teachers at one of the schools, not one that ever taught us, but, like, I know of them because of my family, uh, was having a a swingers party, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but I was driving through this neighborhood, and I recognized this person because I saw them, like, standing out on their front porch. But, like, when you drove around the corner, you could kind of get a glimpse into their backyard. And I think I saw, for sure, about 50 naked people. Oh. And they were all wearing hats. 
like uh. naked from the neck down wearing hats but they were all like very like outrageously different kinds of hats and i know this particular person uh their partner is, is they like work uh doing some kind of specialty thing so they make quite a bit of money uh so i i remember thinking about that for a long time and i was like that is so bonkers that is so bonkers so i wonder if it's the same neighborhood because i'm always hearing about shit that happens there i i might be because it it seems like i don't know i remember hearing this the that story i just told you like my the person of my family has told me it like a few times like yeah. growing up because they just could not believe that this happened and that they knew this person it happened to. Yeah. But, like, it's just so insane. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. I My only hope was that in time, like, I'll learn more of these stories about people that I know and then I can be like, I never knew. <gasps> it's so crazy. Can you believe it? I can't help it. I love Truly. it. <laughs> it's so much fun for me. <laughs> Truly. I love to drink the tea and share the tea. That's just how it goes. It's the but only good part about being near our hometown for me. It has to be. There needs to at least be one good thing. Truly. Uh, <laughs> okay, I am so curious about what your story is. Uh, I honestly think you're going to share some kind of story from our hometown. So, because oh. this is our final episode before uh, we go on break, I thought we would do something fun. I have been on this, like, little uh, Reddit rabbit hole of reading different murders and, like, crimes that happen in people's hometowns. So Mm. I've compiled a few stories. And so I thought that could be a fun thing to uh, do before our hiatus. Ooh, that's, like, super fun. Yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. Cool. So uh, I'll start you off with a story from Just a Little Under Slash Brilliant. They said... My cousin was murdered about three years ago. It was one of the most devastating things that my family has been through. He was at a bar and got into an argument with some guy. Initially, we were told he tried leaving to de-escalate the situation, and the guy followed him and ran him off the road. We were all under the assumption that the car crash killed him. About 48 hours after his death, we were told the guy ran him off the road and and his car crashed into a tree. He was wearing a seatbelt and he actually survived, but was knocked unconscious. The guy pulled over behind my cousin's car and proceeded to stab him to death. Thankfully, the guy was caught and is now in prison, but my cousin lost his life and left behind two small children. Thinking back to when it all happened, it almost felt like we went through a whole new grieving process after finding out it wasn't just an accident, but he was actually murdered. Even after the guy was arrested, additional charges were added because he tried to have his own friend, who was a passenger in his car and witness to the murder, killed so that he couldn't testify against him. Some of our family attended the trial, some did not because it was just too overwhelming. When I went to the arraignment, it was pretty scary. His family started threatening our family inside of the courtroom. Officers had to intervene and it was shown on the news. That's really crazy. I know. Sometimes, like, I don't know, like, I, like, there's a podcast that Emily showed me a few years ago called Small Town Murders, which I'm sure most people have heard of because it's quite popular. Oh, yeah. But, like, I think, like, those small towns, people underestimate just how fucking crazy some of the things that can happen in there, like, are, you know? Oh, totally. And I have a running theory just about life in general where... I think in bigger cities, um, probably a lot of things not necessarily get missed, but they probably have a lot of just like reoccurring like types of things that maybe aren't so bonkers. But it almost feels like crimes that are committed in smaller towns, like around bigger cities or like or places that just aren't that big yet. Uh, it's almost like people are a little bit more unhinged. Like maybe people yeah. who think and feel that way purposely move from bigger cities to smaller places like it, it, it's just a very weird like coincidence almost yeah and i also think because like crime in bigger cities like obviously is going to occur more because there's more people so like the statistics are just in the favor of more crime in bigger cities that like a lot of the things just kind of like it's like you know Every, there's lots of murders so you know not everyone's gonna stick out whereas when it happens in a smaller community it's like crazy and everybody knew the guy who did it and everybody yes. like it's well, just... that's the thing it's not like um 
like unless you have somebody who's like a like a notorious serial killer for example i think in like a bigger city you're not going to have like a lot of people who all know the same person whereas like in a smaller town like pretty much everybody knows everybody or at least like knows a person um, who knows a person right yeah for sure all right um well i will read uh, a story from sunset underscore paradise so they say my cousin was also murdered basically the killer was the boyfriend of a family member who up until that point had seemed trustworthy and like a good person. He was left alone with my little cousins for a few hours when their mom uh, got, but when their mom got back, the youngest was unresponsive. He was already brain dead and died at the hospital. What makes me really angry is that a piece or a, what makes me really angry is that the piece of trash has never taken responsibility and even still has some supporters. He's up for parole soon and the idea of him getting out terrifies me and makes me feel sick. I don't think he'll uh, get out, but the thought still scares me. It's taken uh, so much therapy to get me uh, where I am now and I feel like I'd have to start all over if he was released. My other little cousin, his older sister, was there for the murder and we believe he likely would have killed her too if he'd had more time. I will say that I'm incredibly grateful for everybody who fought to get my family justice and it breaks my heart that my son will never get to meet him, but I believe that he gets to watch over him. Oh, that's really sweet. But yeah, no, uh, but actually, you know, that's another weird thing too, is like a lot of like crimes against children will happen from people who like either know the family or like friends of the family or like stuff like this. Like it's also a thing that happens like a lot, a lot. I know. And like... That's the other thing about, like, crimes in small towns is, like, when that person gets released back into the community, I feel like it would be very hard for them to acclimate because literally everyone knows what they did, who they did it to, and, like, mm-hmm. what happened because of their crime. Oh, totally. And, like, I've even just from, say, for example, listening to Small Town Murder, they will sometimes do, like, um like a wrap up at the end of the case on whether or not that person actually got released or not. And oftentimes if people are re-released back into the same community that they committed the crime in, they get ousted from the town and they have to move somewhere else because people are like refuse to live beside them, don't want them in their neighborhoods, like call the police anytime they see them outside. Like it ends up being a huge deal. Yeah. I mean, I can understand like both sides of the argument, like, But I think it would be very hard, especially if you had a personal connection to the victim. Oh, for sure. That would be, like, doubly hard, for sure. For sure. But I shall read you a story from Wi-Fi Love You. (laughs) Interesting username. Um, My cousin was murdered when I was probably about five years old. In my senior year of high school, a retired investigator slash forensics guy, I don't exactly... I don't remember exactly what he did, came to give a presentation on homicides, crime scene preservation, and evidence recovery. He showed us some grisly things. Dismembered legs from a woman whose killer had disposed of her all across New York City in different trash bins, and a few other things from upstate where I live. One case he showed didn't have a body in the slideshow, but he gave us a tour of the crime scene. It took place in a hotel room where a woman was strangled and left in a running shower for three days. The room was trashed um, as there had been a huge struggle and worlds were scrawled into a once steamed up mirror. And he said that he said were there to mislead the investigation. After the presentation was done, I asked if he had ever heard of my cousin, I obviously will not put her name here for my family's privacy. And he said that the hotel scene was from her murder. My blood ran cold. I mean, I was so young when she was killed that I didn't know any of the details. He said that the killer was probably the most evil man he's encountered in his career. I was kind of in shock and he apologized for us showing the scene. And I still do look back now and wonder why he never asked the class before the presentation if anyone had a family member murdered murdered in our county to avoid this scenario. That's pretty much the extent of that, but I just remember walking through school after in a state of shock. But I'm glad I saw it. I know that most of my family never saw what her last moments were like. It has made me a stronger person and driven me to want to help other women suff- suffering from domestic violence or any form of abuse. Not too interesting of a story, but definitely one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about true crime now. First of all, that whole story makes me nauseous. And also, 
that is so valid on why he wouldn't have asked if anybody knew this person, especially if he's sharing a real life story. In like, or near the place where it happened. Like there very well might be someone who had a connection to that victim. And you know, well, there ended up being somebody with a connection to the victim. Like, like how can you call yourself an investigator of any sort? If you can't even like, if you can't like, even, think, like, think of that through that, oh, that makes me that angry, would, but I honestly, that would be so triggering to like, know that someone in your family was murdered, but like not really know much about it. And then by happenstance while at school, be showing like the grisly details of their murder and like find out that way for the first time. Oh, for sure. And like not to be like too grim or anything, but I honestly hope the investigator like learned something from that experience on how like to properly appro- uh, like approach sensitive subject matter, especially yeah. with like children of children is a big one (laughs) or even just like people who are probably not in your work field and don't see a lot of that kind of stuff i know it's kind of easy to like um brush stuff kind of under the rug or like or gloss over it if like you deal with it every day but like if you work in a sensitive industry i think that's something that you definitely need to take into consideration more that not everyone sees those things every day and not everyone's like prepared to see those things every day well like and i do understand that like if you're in a forensic class like you probably are prepared to see that kind of stuff but also still remembering that like it these are still real people's lives like i think if i was him in a similar situation what i would have done is i would have falsified a case and been like here is a example situation of a case where but like compile elements from a few different ones so you're not just like you know yeah or like not show ones from what that happened like in that county or like near that county yeah see i don't know there's definitely better ways that could have been approached but uh like i said i hope that he learned something from that because uh that's rough i feel very bad for uh for wi-fi loves you that would be very sad yeah yikes all right let's go with a story from definitely likes pasta which that's relatable um (laughs) (laughs) so uh pasta says when i was in high school like senior year we had a 10 year old boy go missing and everybody everyone in the community helped with the search they brought in dogs helicopters you name it they got so desperate that they had brought in a psychic that claimed to have gotten some kind of vision or sense that this child was killed and buried somewhere on the property. But that's as far as it got because they couldn't believe that uh, the mom or the kid's older brother could have had, any- had anything to do with it. But fast forward a few days and the psychic is still claiming that he's buried on the property. They bring dogs down to go and look and sure enough they find him bludgeoned and buried uh, down on the further end of their property. Come to find out that the older brother had a myriad of severe mental illnesses, got enraged out of nowhere, and bludgeoned his brother to death with a big-ass rock and claimed it was an accident. He told mom, and she covered it up uh, and lied as best as she could. They also told everyone that he had autism for some reason, which he didn't. And I don't remember what happened at the trial, but I know that he was sent away somewhere, either prison or mental hospital. And I think he was either 16... I think he... He was, I think, either 16 or 17, but they tried him as an adult. And I actually also think that he was recently released, which that is horrifying also. Yeah, I mean, like, that's like a similar, like, theory as to what people think happened in the John Bonet Ramsey case, where they think, like, the brother may have had something to do with it and the Mm -hmm. parents covered it up. But, like, that would be, like, such a hard situation to be in as a parent oh, for sure especially like if it's like family on family violence because as a parent you feel responsible for for protecting all of them mm-hmm. so i don't know like that t- type of stuff too always feels like really um really sensitive and definitely sad to think about but um not to distract too much from this particular story but just the beginning part reminded me of another crime story which i if i can remember the name of it i'll let you know which one it is but um there was something that happened where it was like a similar thing where people were at school and a a a younger boy went missing during the day um but it ended up being a thing where he had 
gone to the gym between classes to go and get his running shoes because he was keeping them like stashed away in some mats that were rolled up and he had gotten stuck upside down in one of the mats and because the mats were so densely put together nobody could hear him and he was so small that he actually had sunk down all the way into them and he ended up (gasps) dying of blood rushing into his head because he couldn't get out of these mats and nobody could hear him. That's horrifying. I hate I, that so much. I know. This is so every now and again, just with like, well, like our podcast and everything and like listening to crime podcasts, I'll hear something and it, like, it just stuck, like sticks with me forever. So anytime I hear a story where it's like a kid goes missing during the day and nobody can find him, I'm like, oh my God, no. Check the mats. <laughs> Now check, check the walls, check the ceilings, find the child. Because, like, stuff happens sometimes. And it was the additional layer to it on why this in particular was a crime case. It wasn't just the missing child. um, But it was actually also that uh, this kid had a couple of childhood bullies. And one of them had actually seen him go into the gym and ha- and like saw him struggling in the mats and it actually pushed him further down. Oh, no. And that's one of the reasons why he wasn't able to get out because his feet were originally latched around the top of the mat so that he could pull himself back out. But this kid went along and pushed him in so that he couldn't and he got wedged in and then left him there and didn't tell anybody because he thought he was going to get into trouble. Dude, that's so bad. I know. But and then that's another thing, too, is that like... uh the spooky thing about children in general is that in a lot of like child crime cases, it becomes very obvious how like um, children up until a certain point, they do not have a concept of like what consequences are or what like certain things do. So like, especially in, in like cases of say like severe bullying or like say something happens, like most children do not feel any guilt from it because they don't can't conceptualize like what, right versus wrong is or why what they did has a permanent consequence of somebody losing their life yeah that's scary right so that'll have to be a story for another day but yeah no this remind me of that though because i was like reading it and i was like i really hope this is what i think it was it wasn't but it was still very sad so very close oh yeah all right well i'll read you one from own administration 918 they say In my hometown, a six-year-old girl was kidnapped and murdered. It was in the 80s, I believe. It was my mom's best friend, neighbor, her neighbor, a lovely little girl, Colette. The whole town was out every day searching for her. My mom was pregnant with my sister at the time, and she even went out on the searches despite being heavily pregnant. Every one of my parents' friends have said they were there uh, were there looking every night. Unfortunately, Collette was murdered by her next door neighbor, the other side, not my mom's friend. And she had asked her if she wanted some money for sweets, sent her to buy some, and then brought her in this house and then he raped and murdered her. At the time, he wasn't tried for rape, so to spare the parents of the awful details, because he wasn't tried for the rape, he wasn't on the sex offender registry, do and he was due to be released in 2021 and thankfully everyone in the town rallied and around and he was put on the sex offender list thank god they had only found this guy because he tried to commit suicide and left a note saying he had done wrong and his friend reported him he had joined in the searches for her all while she was in his attic it breaks my heart thinking of her last moments of how scared she must have been not understanding what was happening I really don't know a lot of the details and I don't want to. My heart just breaks for her. That is deeply upsetting. And also, like, this is what I'm saying. If it's outside, lock it down, including your kids. Because, like, you might think you know the people you live around. You have no idea, like, what any of those people's lives are like or what they are doing or anything. It's true. It's very true. My dad used to tell me when I was a kid, like... You really don't know people as well as you think you do, and you don't know their intentions, so you have to be careful about, like, who you surround Mm -hmm. yourself with. Especially people in passing. I've learned that one, too, is that, like, you can see somebody casually for, like, say, like, years and be like, oh, yeah, like, I know them. They're, like, this person or this person or whatever. And then, like, they end up having, like, a totally different life than what you expect, and, like, that's that's just how it is. Like, I don't trust nobody. Don't trust nobody. Lock your kids down. Lock them down. Put them on a leash. 
Yeah. Well, this also kind of reminds me of, um, well, obviously I feel like with most crimes, there's usually a comparable, uh, case at least, but with this one, it kind of reminds me of, um, the one where I'm so bad with names. I usually just remember what, like what the situation was, but, um, there was something similar where there was a young girl who went missing and, uh, there was a, a, like everybody in the neighborhood had joined like the search and everything. And she ended up being, uh, raped and murdered and hid under a neighborhood kid's waterbed or something. Do you know? What I think we were about? talking about this, weren't we? Yeah, I think you've talked. I think you shared this case, but it would have been pretty early on. Cause yeah, it was like a thing where he had uh, joined the search to go and look for her, and nobody suspected him. And then the mom found her body under the waterbed because she thought the waterbed was leaking. Yes, I feel like we did talk about this case because that's exactly what I was thinking of too, and I couldn't remember. If it was from these notes when I was doing my research or if I had mm-hmm. shared that story another time. But, like, that it's is... It's also possible so that we've, like, heard of this case from, like, a different podcast or something. But, no, like, I do remember at some point at least, like, having talked about this case with you even in passing and being like, oh, my gosh, like, like this, this, and this. Like, you know? So spooky. Oh, so spooky. Again, don't trust nobody. Lock your kids down. Don't trust nobody with a waterbed. That's the moral of the story. Actually, also that one, which I never did. So, <laughs> I mean, nothing's <laughs> changed. Still don't trust him. Waterbeds, out. Exactly. Gosh, that's funny. All right. Let's move on to a story from The K-Bug. So, uh, Bug says, when I was in second grade, I moved to a very tiny town in Delaware to live with my grandparents after my parents' divorce. Being a shy kid and a, in a... Blah, 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 And small town dynamics being what they are, it was very hard for me to make friends. Um, There was a nice, quiet little boy that lived next door named Bradley that was in my class. And he was my only friend. I used to ask him to come outside and play a lot. And his mom was always a little scary to me. But again, shy kids scare most unfamiliar adults, which I guess makes sense. So Um, at some point I went to get him to play and his mom told me that he had gone to his grandparents' house and that he wasn't going to be back for a while. So not to come back. Turns out that she had sent him away because she discovered her boyfriend was cheating and murdered him. She was trying to get the house in order and figure out what to do with the body. She wrapped him in trash bags and put him in the basement. Weeks went by and when the furnace broke, she called the repairman who discovered the body. Yeah, obviously not a criminal mastermind, which... (laughs) That's fine. So... Uh, we had a police helicopter land in our yard and police dogs searched, uh, searching their, uh, theirs and our property for the gun. And my grandma was interviewed on the news, etc. It was literally the talk of the town and all the adults seemed pretty excited about the scandal. But I just remember <laughs> really missing my friend and was sad I never got a chance to say goodbye. I still wonder what happened to him and I hope he has a good life out there somewhere. Which, honestly though... The K-Bug on the very slim chance you ever listen to this podcast. Um, I would say that the fact that he safely got out of that situation and was living with people who probably also really care deeply about him, that is mountain times better than where he would have been. So I would assume that he's doing better with how he ended up in that situation. I would think so, considering the potential alternative. Yes, which uh, is usually the mindset that a lot of people have when they murder, which is leave no witnesses. Um, Yeah. yeah. So that's still terrible, though. And, like, I don't know. See, there was some... Again, with all these stories, there's it always, like, like... Like, there's, like, a little tinkling sound that goes off in my brain that, like, reminds me of something else. But, um, no, just, like, the whole thing, too, about, like, um, like, violence that follows relationships, it's also a really spooky thing. It is. It for sure is. The fact that somebody who you love and care about deeply and spend your life with might try and murder you or harm you is a spooky thought for sure oh exactly especially because i feel like most people when they're getting into relationships they're not anticipating that the person that they're with is looking to hurt them murder them which is the other part of it too but yeah not the vibe but Mm, no i shall share you another (laughs) i shall share I uh, shall share you another story. <laughs> I shall share you another story by the user J Miracle twenty nineteen. They say, when I was eighteen, my roommate murdered my other roommate over a bowl of cereal. It was horrific. <sighs> Sorry, 
I should not be laughing. Just that, <laughs> just that first line. I'm like, okay, so far it is murder. So obviously bad. <laughs> Over cereal, I have some questions. <laughs> first of all, what kind of cereal? If it was Honey Nut Cheerios or Mini Wheats, I don't think it's justified. Or Raisin Bran? Like, no. imagine being murdered Vector? over a bowl of Raisin Bran. Oh my god, if I was murdered over a bowl of Raisin Bran, I would be back to haunt. Like, non-negotiable. You would not be able to get rid of me. I would make sure that everybody suffered until the day they died. And then I would finally be at peace. Oh my god. So they say, I went upstairs... From the attached garage studio I was renting and hesitated before grabbing the doorknob. I got a bad, bad feeling. When I opened the door, I saw red. Literally, the walls, the floors, and the ceiling were covered in it. Then I noticed my roommate was standing there holding a cordless house phone. And I remember thinking, why isn't that a knife he's holding? Because my other roommate, Steven, was lying on the floor across the living room, covered head to toe in blood and stab wounds. He called out to me, garbling my name and begging me to help him. I stupidly asked the roommate with the phone, what happened? And he said, I stabbed him. What do you think happened? I backed the couple feet up to my door and darted inside, locked it, ran downstairs to my bathroom and slammed and locked the door. I climbed into my bathtub and called my boyfriend and he said, hey babe, what's up? And I told him what I had seen and he said, well, I'm busy right now. Can we talk about it later? But <laughs> lathergasted, I came to my senses enough to call the police and once I heard them tackle my roommate upstairs, I ran outside using my door and saw the, a cord of police and ambulances and fire trucks. I sat down on the curb and looked up only when they wheeled Stephen past me on a gurney. His clothes were gone except for his tidy whities which were blood red he died by bleeding out that night at the hospital and they had to testify at the trial five years later he was convicted first of all good second of all i definitely laughed way too early because that situation terrifying also, i feel so bad for her dealing with it but also award for the, the world's worth boyfriend the audacity of this man to pick up the phone and her being like i think my roommate killed my other roommate and him to be like oh, i'm busy right now can we talk later forget about it forget about it we're First breaking all, up not even it's like Funny enough, I actually think my partner would probably do something similar, but it would only be because he just genuinely would not be absorbing what I said and just be, like, ready to tell me that he's busy. And then he'd call me back, like, <laughs> five minutes later and be like, okay, but, like, when we were on the phone last, you said something about a murder? <laughs> <laughs> could you just could you just brief me on that quick <laughs> like i just can't get it out of my head i need to make sure we're on the same page here i just want to make sure like is that actually what you said or am i or did i like mishear something which it, for sure something he would do but uh i don't know man that it, it plus the whole like uh like just everything else like i am just gobsmacked i can't even believe that I cannot even imagine being in that situation where you, like, live with, like, two sane-ish people and one of them kills the other one with, I'm assuming it was the cordless phone, over cereal. I mean, there he was apparently bleeding a lot, so there must have been a knife involved at some point. You'd think so. But, like, I'm imagining, though, I don't know if this is the truth or not, but if it was over cereal... I'm imagining that the roommate probably stole the other roommate's cereal or something, and he went to go make himself a bowl of cereal, and there was no cereal left. Yeah. Just, I have a feeling. A hunch, if you would. As a hypothesis? <laughs> As a hypothesis. Uh, but no, that's bonkers. Some people are just very unhinged, I think. I think so too, and are like set off by the smallest things and like ready to go full ham mm -hmm. on anything. And like different levels of unhinged. Because on one end you have like somebody who's like ready to like go for blood over missing cereal, I'm assuming. And then you have the other kind of unhinged where you hear somebody crying and telling you about a murder and you tell them that you're too busy. <laughs> That is like, the other kind of unhinged. There's many levels here. Definitely. Definitely levels of unhinged. 
Oh my gosh. I feel so bad though for the, for the lady who witnessed that. That would be, you would carry that with you forever, especially because like, um, she kind of mentioned this or they kind of mentioned this. Um, but the, like the mentioning of the walls being covered in red, like a human body holds so much blood. Yeah. Like, so much blood. So anything that's, like, a brutal attack, like, it's supposed to be, like, almost shocking how much blood people have. Yeah. Ugh. I, I, I hate that. So, <laughs> on so many levels. You're like, Emily, please, the last thing I want to talk about is blood or needles. Thank you. <laughs> or pirates. <laughs> yeah, th- I draw the line there. <laughs> those are the toxic three. We don't talk about those. Um... But yeah, I will read uh, what looks to be my last story here, which is from Mass Mat Matsative Matsative, yes, Matsative, sure, yes. Um, so they say it is a pretty short tale, but in my hometown of eight hundred people, my friend's aunt committed suicide, and th- that's in brackets. So this is all secondhand information, so consider that. Uh, she was found with a gunshot wound to the back of her head, and there was allegedly a 911 recording of her boyfriend calling for help, but there were gaps in the transcription where he can be heard asking himself what he'd done or something. And according to secondhand accounts from the lady's family, the boyfriend claimed that he had found the body and that she must have shot herself in the back of the head. And the story is that the gun was found in her left hand and the contact angle of the bullet would have wound was from the right. Uh, there were a lot of suspicious details, but I heard that the coroner ruled the cause of death a suicide uh, or as inconclusive, one or the other. Um, last I heard, the case had been dropped uh, by the sheriff's office, which is bullshit to me because um, that was very obviously not a suicide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, as far as like how clearly things go to, to start... Uh, not putting, like, this thought on anybody's head, but I think if, like, somebody that is choosing to end their life that way, you wouldn't go through the extra effort of reaching around to the back of your head. That's a pretty awkward angle. I feel like that would be uncommon, for sure. Definitely. Especially because, like, usually with that style of gunshot wound, um, I know that normally people call it a, uh, there's a certain name for it. It's like, um... Oh, I'm, I can't remember it now. But basically, um, that type is usually categorized as being, like, um, a mer- either, like, a mercy shot or something. But basically, like, if you have somebody as, like, a prisoner, that's what you would do is you would shoot them in the back of the head. So, like, they can't see it is the idea. But nobody can reach around and get that angle themselves, though. Especially if the angle of it was from the wrong hand that she had the gun in her hand. Yeah, like, as far as things stack, I don't think that was a suicide, but... I- I'm gonna who, go with, I to think, say? probably not. Mm, no, I would I would have to agree with Matt's Tiv, Matt's Tiv, Matt's Tiv. That guy. I think they, they are on the right track. I, too, agree with that. Yes, and I shall read you my final story, leading under slash tooth under slash 8957. They say, my brother-in-law was murdered in his own home. He shot the man in the heart before com- before succumbing to his injuries. Check chest and neck. Wow, I can't read right now. <laughs> chest and neck gunshot was a very hard time for the family and acquaintance of the murdered or of the family murdered his autistic son last year. He, the son, was 32 if I remember correctly. He killed him and left him in the living room floor for over a week in the searing heat. They had no running water and the state had been doing checks on him. The state PNP here is a fucking joke. The family tried for years to have him removed from his father's custody, but the state not caring did nothing. My cousin said the house looked like something off of a hoarder show. It had been torn down immediately after. A girl I went to school with, her daughter, was murdered, put in a duffel bag, and thrown into a river. Some meth had murdered his girlfriend's daughter. She was a twin. He killed her and threw her in as well. They were on the run for several days before being caught. The mother was trashed too and had 
and had to have been involved. She had played the victim and wasn't charged. I have a friend who's been missing for over 20 years and they know she's deceased and who did it but can't prove it yet. I hold on to the... I hold on to the every ounce of hope she's finally charged with her murder and she can possibly be found. She left behind three small children and the youngest was eight months old when she went missing. He lives not far from me and it absolutely disgusts me that he's still walking free. We have a baby doe who was found at a lake in a suitcase 30 plus years ago. The case is rarely talked about and I'd say more than half the people in the area know nothing about this child being murdered. There's a few more but I'm pressed for time and can't write them all. Murder leaves a scar that never heals it may scab over but it's just under the surface as raw as the day it happened i would say that whatever hometown he lives in there's like a fuck ton of unsolved murders and uh maybe the police should get on that i think the whole police department at that point should just get fired and refilled in with new people because that's ridiculous how are there that many like yeah. that many like that's a lot he's like fucking five murders in like a paragraph Oh, for sure. And I do like, though, that um, uh, Mr. Tooth here uh, did say, though, that uh, murder is a scar that never heals. It may scab, but it's uh, under the surf or it may scab over, but just under the surface is as raw as the day it happened. Because honestly, I can see that because especially it's the same as with like... um, like a unprecedented death. Like you're not, you aren't in a position where you're prepared for it to happen, especially if it happens to somebody, you know, and then you have to deal with like not having them there anymore. What had happened to them? Like how horrific it was, like how it's impacted everybody, their own families, like all this other stuff. Right. And it's like a sudden thing too. Right. Like I think it's not necessarily easier when you know someone has like a a long-term illness and you like but you at least have a chance to like come to terms with that they'll probably pass and you can Mm -hmm. say goodbye and you know kind of tie up some of those loose ends versus when it happens like suddenly and unexpectedly then people just are left with all of these like I never got to say goodbye I never you know got to give them the last hug you know Mm mm-hmm I know, and that's also, like, one of the things that really breaks my heart, too, about, say, with having this podcast when it comes to, like, crimes and stuff, is that the stories are never going to be told by the people who died. It's always going to be from the victims and the victims' families and, like, their accounts or by people who were friends with them and all these different things. And, like, um, you know, it's it definitely doesn't get any easier. And a lot of these things are truly some horrific things that were done by horrific people and people who need help and all these other things and nothing is ever going to make that better really no truly yeah yep and that's <laughs> my thoughts on that like and i don't know yeah so it is interesting though hearing uh, a story though say from somebody who experienced it for themselves versus like say a news article too i think that there's a lot more of um like heart put into it because they are sharing also like how they feel about it and i think that's an important part of it too because it's so easy for people to extrapolate um just the basics of what happened versus like what the impact was Mm -hmm. especially if it like becomes a new story so i think this part is also like super important for sure and to hear you know just the, the different ways that impacts people because i think that people also deal with trauma and pain in such different ways that Mm -hmm. it definitely manifests itself in like a variety of forms oh for sure and i'm also really uh, glad that with the stories you picked today that like there was such a variety because honestly like with some of these crimes like they were either they either in some ways were similar to other ones that have happened which is very sad or they were totally unexpected right like cereal like cereal which like It's that particular one is a little crazy to me because I to like with us being past the college university era, um, I totally remember there being arguments that people would have with each other if they like had a roommate who would steal food and all these other things. But like I would never would have put on like the scalability of things that like murder could actually happen. But like that's another thing, though, too. It has to do with like people's relationships with each other and their mental health and how well they manage like their emotions and all these other things whether or not they have any like uh mental illness that's unchecked or like other things right very true definitely a scary world that we live in but um interesting stories that come from it sad stories a lot of the times or 99 percent. yeah 
but yeah. also with the knowledge though that uh you need to keep everything tied down and also not to totally trust people that you don't know either it's true if it's outside and ain't tied down you might lose it that's the moral of the story be prepared to lose it either by a tornado or a neighbor <laughs> <laughs> at least where we come from <laughs> at least where we come from right i know that's really funny uh but yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I don't have anything else to add. I don't know if there's anything else that you want to plug into our little last episode here before we go on break, but... No, I think that's it. Uh, I think you can just roll straight into our end credits, Em. Awesome. So, uh, to start, we do have a website if you guys want to check us out on there, which is www.wheelcrime.com. Um, we are also available on social media, which is at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, at Wheel of Crime. Um, if you would like to donate to the show, maybe sign up for a subscription and get a little something out of uh, your time for supporting us, you can visit us on Patreon, which is at Wheel of Crime. Besides that, if you really like the show and you want to show your support for us, if you could give us a review on wherever you're listening to us now, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And besides that, if you would like to send us an email and just uh, share an opinion or a thought that you have, a story of your own, maybe you want to add on to anything that we've talked about in our episode today or any previous episodes that we've shared, you can always send us an email, which is wheelofcrime at gmail.com. Yes, and with that, that brings us to the end of our episode. We will see you all again very soon on June 24th. We shall return. Yes. And I hope you all have a good month. We'll see you soon. Bye. Yes. Bye.